Have you ever wondered how Europe recovered and became prosperous again after the Second World War? Think about it. After the conflict, the streets of European capitals such as London or Berlin were mostly piles of rubbish, where it would be difficult for any person or business to settle. The industrial zones were the target of countless bombings that left almost no factory standing, and many factory workers had been killed or disabled forever. In other words, everything that had been built up in the industrial Europe over decades was annihilated in just six years of war. Europe had gone from being the world's great power to a region that had to start from scratch. And yet, here we are today. In a few years, the destroyed Europe quickly became a pole of wealth and prosperity again. In a short time, Europe's major economies were once again at the top of the economic wealth rankings, practically neck and neck with countries such as the United States and Canada. The question is, how is this huge milestone achieved? Okay, the most common answer to this question is usually the Marshall Plan. A huge aid plan totaling more than $124 billion in today's money that the United States gave to Europe in order to prevent the Soviet Union from spreading communism throughout a severely weakened region. However, pay attention. While this is the aid that the Marshall Plan earmarked for Europe's development, all of this is what has been allocated to Africa since the 1960s to try to bring the continent out of poverty. So the question we can all ask ourselves is, how is it possible that after so much aid for Africa, it has not managed to escape from poverty? What use has all this enormous amount of money been? Has it just been thrown down the drain? Well, take a second, because it doesn't end there. It's not just that aid didn't help Africa escape poverty, but as aid increased throughout the 20th century, economic growth in African countries went from bad to worse. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have just had your heads explode. Is it possible that the huge aid campaigns that developed countries and NGOs have channeled into Africa have had exactly the opposite result of the one intended? And if this is so, why on earth did the Marshall Plan serve to rescue Europe, but aid to the African continent has had a very different effect? Well, you know what? We're gonna answer the first question right now. Yes, it is entirely possible that international aid money and schemes have greatly harmed African economies. In fact, in this video, we're gonna tell you the real stories of how numerous humanitarian interventions in Africa have failed miserably. We'll tell you why they have done so and the aspects so that we can avoid doing it in the future. Are you ready to get started? Of course you are. So let's get cracking. A side note before we begin, you can learn all about this stories in Javier Sala y Martin's book Economics in Colours. You see, a few years ago, this Columbia University professor specialising in development economics had a plan for an African school. He wanted to install dozens of computers in the school so that the children could study with all of the information and tools available here on the internet. To achieve this, he made an agreement with a processor company that would pay for the computers and he got down to work. The first step was to go down to the school and announce his grand plan. So, no sooner said than done. But when he arrived, he started talking to Sharo Vasquez, the nun who ran the centre, and explained that he was an economist from New York who specialised in the development of poor countries and that he had gone there because he believed that African children should not miss out on the countless benefits of the internet age. However, as Javier was speaking, the nun looked at him with a strange look on her face, as if suddenly another innocent European altruist had arrived who, without ever having set foot in Africa in his life, suddenly had a solution for everything. So, when our protagonist finished his speech, the nun said to him, Look, do you really want to help the children in this school to learn. At that point, Javier replied with a surprised look on his face, of course, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to donate thousands of computers to the schools in Africa. To which the nun replied, well, if what you really want is for the children you see here to be able to study, keep the computers to yourself, because what we really need are toilets. Surprise! <laughs> Wait, wait, what? What on earth does a toilet have to do with children studying? Well, as Charo explained to him, no matter how many computers and internet connections the classrooms had, this would be useless if the children did not go to class and the classrooms were still half empty. But how could a toilet get African children to go to school? Well, in this case, we are talking more about the girls. If there were no proper toilets in the schools, when they had their first period, they preferred to stay at home and stopped going to class. Therefore, if the economist really wanted to improve basic education in this part of Africa, what he had to get was toilets rather than computers. And do you know what? This is one of the biggest problems of developmental aid. At the very least, when we want to help someone, the first thing we have to do is ask them exactly what they need. Unfortunately, many, many aid plans do not adjust to this local reality. Because don't think that this example of computers and toilets is an isolated case. 
Not at all. For example, in another intervention carried out in 150 rural schools in Kenya, international experts determined that the best way for the villages the schools were in to become economically active was to bring high voltage power lines to them so that every household would have access to electricity. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the truth is that the measure served no purpose other than to burn through a few million dollars. Why? Well, because the inhabitants of the villages had no resources to buy electrical appliances, and so the electricity served no use for them. Now, does this mean that it would just be enough to ask? Would this improve the use we make of development aid and help Africa leave poverty behind once and for all? Well, visual economic community, I'm sorry to disappoint you again, but the answer is no. Even if Mr. Javier had succeeded in equipping schools with toilets, the results might have been equally fruitless. Why? Well, check this out. Unfair competition and collateral damage. Emmanuel Kwasi was a young Ghanaian who, after finishing his basic education at the turn of the century, was unable to attend university. Which, by the way, was not at all strange in a country where one out of every two people could neither read nor write. However, Emmanuel was a smart guy. He had concerns and very, very much wanted to get ahead. Also, just around this time, a new technology was arriving in Ghana that seemed quite promising. The internet. Does any of this sound familiar? The fact is that Emmanuel decided to try his luck. He got a computer, studied programming, and after a while, he was able to set up by himself a reasonably acceptable amount of web pages. He only needed to make this ability profitable. Fortunately, starting in the 2000s, as you can see in this graph, Ghana entered an era of accelerated economic growth. There were more and more local companies to which Emmanuel could offer his services as a programmer. And so it was that in no time at all, Emmanuel set up his own programming company, Soft Internet Solutions, a company that was doing so well that he ended up teaching and hiring his brother to lend a hand. Then he hired a friend and then a friend of a friend. And a few years later, Soft Internet Solutions was a highly productive company employing 25 young Ghanaians. Everything was going smoothly and at full speed ahead. An enterprising Ghanaian who couldn't go to university had managed to get a major technology company off the ground. At the time, there was nothing that could stop him except from one thing international aid. The NGO, German Technical Cooperation, along with the German government, came up with the fantastic idea of raising funds to launch a campaign to help African companies connect to the internet. Do you want to know how they wanted to do it? Well, basically, they were looking for German volunteers to make web pages and deliver them to companies completely free of charge. Obviously, as you can imagine, soft internet solutions and many other profitable and thriving Ghanaian technology startups went belly up. And today, Emmanuel Kwasi is a cab driver who has emigrated to London. So what's our conclusion here? Well, not only is it necessary to know exactly what is needed in developing countries, but also to prevent aid from ending up hurting local companies and workers. In other words, to avoid aid becoming what we could call a huge force for unfair competition. Yes, things are not always as simple as they might seem at first glance. Now then, if we help developing countries with the things they need, and we also make sure that we don't screw over local businesses, would the aid work once and for all? Well, not necessarily. Sorry, but even then, it wouldn't be guaranteed to work. Why? Because another thing we tend to overlook is all the unexpected consequences and effects of all this aid. But to illustrate this more clearly, let's take an example. When international aid built large hospitals in some African cities to treat the sick from the tropical epidemics that had hit the continent regularly. In this case, things worked. The aid worked, life expectancy increased, contagious diseases decreased, infant mortality decreased. The whole thing was a success. Or rather, it was a success in the cities. But do you know where the doctors who worked before the NGOs set up and subsidized the hospitals in the center of these big cities? Exactly, in the villages. So while everything was working in the big hospitals, in many villages and more remote areas, people were dying with no healthcare able to treat them. You see, unexpected consequences. Now, does this mean that no aid to the African continent can work, that all projects go wrong and have unintended consequences that can prove fatal? No, not at all. Do you know why? Because it is now possible to learn from your mistakes. For example, an economist named Esther Duflo of the Poverty Action Lab was the creator of one of these attempts to help, but it was of little use. You see, in many schools in rural areas, teachers were not attending classes, or at best had absentee rates that were outrageously high. Many of them had to walk more than two hours to get to school. So since no one was monitoring them, let's just say many days, they decided to skip the walk. To correct the situation, Esther Duflo's team decided to hire substitute teachers to teach whenever the main teacher was absent. So at the end of the school year, Esther evaluated the performance and evolution of the students and realized that 
Her measures had been useless. It turned out that the substitute teachers were so bad that even if the children had a teacher every day, it was with no use to them. Remember that we are in Africa, so it's not so easy to find qualified teachers. So here we have another ambitious aid program in Africa, which has failed. One more to add to the list, more money down the drain. But hold on just a moment, because here comes the good stuff. Faced with such a failure, Esther came up with an idea to put a camera in every classroom. What do you mean a camera, Grant? What on earth would you want a camera for? Well, you see, every time a teacher attended class, he or she had to have his picture taken with the children to prove that the teacher had been to work. And if the end of the month, he or she had a photo for most days, then the teacher could usually get paid up to three times their usual salary. And do you know what happened? Well, with an investment as small as a simple camera, the attendance rate skyrocketed and with it, the student's performance. Esther had come up with an aid program that worked, had no adverse effects and was very inexpensive. So now, at this point, you might be confused. Is it worth donating money? Yes? No? There is no answer that is 100% accurate. There are some projects that work, some that don't, and there are some whose results are exactly the opposite of what was intended. So, if we had to recommend something from Visual Economic, it would be that if you do donate, do it to specific projects that meet all the conditions that we have seen in this video. In any case, what we can be absolutely certain of is that the data tells us time and time again that humanitarian aid, at least that directed at the national level, is not at all synonymous with economic growth and development. In fact, the studies carried out on the issue are very clear. The African countries that have received the most aid in recent decades are precisely those that have had the most trouble escaping poverty. Take a look at this. According to a study by William Easterly, this happens mainly because governments that receive a huge amount of aid do not have to worry about keeping people happy or promoting development to stay in power, so they can be more easily corrupted. You could say that the international aid finances their excesses. According to this author, international aid only works in countries where the developed rule of law is present, where corruption is low, and where it is ensured that the money gets to where it needs to go, as was the case, for example, with the Marshall Plan after World War II. And take note, because not even all economists are convinced that the Marshall Plan was the key to European reconstruction. Among other reasons, because the great European recovery had begun years before the first batches of money arrived from the United States. Because Germany, which was the power that received the least money, recovered before any other. And because countries like the Netherlands used the money for purposes completely different from recovery. For example, for the invasion of Indonesia. In any case, after this video, we are still left with one question. If economic aid to Africa is blocking it from escaping poverty, and if the Marshall Plan did not seem to be a determining factor in the European recovery, what can Africa do? do to get out of poverty. Well, visual economic fans, what can be done is something they have been doing for the past two decades, and that has led not only to substantial improvements in living conditions, but also the economic takeoff of countries like Rwanda, Botswana, and Ethiopia, at least until the 2021 conflict. This is something we have talked about at length on our sister channel, Visual Politic. We'll leave you a few links down below in the description. But at this point, the question is for all of you. How do you rate the work of NGOs? How do you think you could personally help developing countries if not through them? In what way could wealthy countries control the funds destined for poor countries? Leave us your answer in the comments below. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. Subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know, and I'll see you next time.